There are two fetters associated with a sense of self. One is self-identity view, and the other is conceit. The quick explanation of the difference between the two is that with self-identity view, you have a sense of, I am this. You have a specific object with which you identify. With conceit, it's simply, I am. It's a more undefined sense of self. The longer explanation is that with self-identity view, you can create a sense of self around any of the five aggregates. And there are four ways you can do it with each of the aggregates. Take form, for example, your body. You can either identify yourself as being the body, or you can identify yourself as being the owner of the body. We're going to have a sense that you are in the body, or that the body is in you. With that last one, you can have an infinite sense of self, a cosmic sense of self, within which the body moves. Or simply an enlarged sense of, say, consciousness that envelops the body. And in that case, you identify with the consciousness, but at the same time you have a sense that the body is inside you. So five aggregates, four ways of identifying, 20 different self-identity views. With conceit, it's explained in different ways. There's a passage where a, a non-returner who, who has abandoned self-identity views but still has an abandoned conceit explains to a group of monks that even though he doesn't identify around the five aggregates, still there's a lingering sense of self, a lingering sense of I am. He compares it to washing some clothes, and then the clothes will still have the smell of the soap. In other words, a sense of I am that was doing the practice. For a non-returner, that means they perfected virtue, they perfected their concentration. The I who is doing that is still the lingering scent. Now this I am can have nine different forms, they say, in which you compare yourself to others. Either the other person is worse than you are, or equal to you, or better than you. In each case you can say the other person is worse, or equal, or better. Which means that even when you're correct, in your estimation. It still counts as conceit. Now the fact that conceit is one of the last fetters that's abandoned gets some people to say, well, I don't have to worry about it right now. But it has its skillful and unskillful uses on the path, and it's important to notice the difference. The unskillful ones are like the passage we had just now, that we chatted just now, we're talking about the person who in this particular case, does not exalt himself over others for the fact that he is more content than they are, doesn't exalt himself, doesn't disparage others, which means the unskillful use of conceit there would be you're practicing a particular practice, either in terms of virtue or your concentration, and because you have a better attainment than somebody else, you say, well, I'm just a better person. That, the Buddha says, is a mark of a person of no integrity. You have to remember, each of us is on the path because we have the disease of greed, aversion, and delusion. We're here treating our diseases. We're not here in a race. So if you have a virtue of any kind, but then you use that virtue as a means for, or basis for, looking down on other people, you've spoiled the virtue, you've spoiled the integrity of the virtue. 
However, there are skillful uses of conceit. One is if you see somebody's better than you are in something. And you tell yourself, if they can do it, I can do it too. This is a useful way of, of thinking when you're living here in the monastery. It's impossible for me to teach you everything that I learned over in Thailand, because a lot of what I learned had to do with just ways of acting in different circumstances. It was never really articulated. It was just a sense that I picked up from being around John Fuan and trying to notice. What he did that was seemed to be skillful. And so it's up to you to look around. Look for good examples around you. Say, well, I can take that as an example. Here's an area where I have some room for improvement. One of the things I really found helpful in dealing with Ajahn Fuang was he made the comment one time that when an Ajahn does something, he has a reason. He wouldn't explain it all the time. It was up to me to look for the reason, try to figure it out. Now, I've encountered some other Westerners who were monks over in Thailand, and they had written off some of the behavior of their teachers simply as, well, that's the way the Thais do it. Which meant, of course, that when they came back to the West, that they wouldn't be doing it here. And that deprived them of the opportunity to think about, well, what would be a good reason for that kind of behavior? This way, when you assume that there are people around you who are wiser or more skillful, and you're trying to figure out exactly how, like exactly why, you grow as a person. So that way of comparing yourself is actually useful. It's a necessary part of the path, necessary part of the training. Another skillful use, of course, is the one that Ananda talks about, He says, you think about the fact there are people who are awakened, and you remind yourself, they're human beings, I'm a human being. They can do it, I can do it too. That, he says, is this necessary use of conceit on the path. So conceit has its uses. After all, it functions as a sense of I that's going to be responsible to do the path. And because it involves a, a sense of judgment, a comparison, it's useful for times when you realize that I could be doing things better than I am. There are examples around, I can learn from the examples. And of course, there's that sense that you're going to benefit from all this. It's only when you get to the very end of the path that you don't need that sense of, I am. And you realize it's one of the things that's standing in the way of total freedom. But it is one of the last things you let go. And in the meantime, learn how to use it skillfully. Otherwise, it, in a John Mahabhu's phrase, it grows fangs. Especially when you're exalting yourself and disparaging others. But if you can use that sense of I am, to remind yourself that I am suffering, but I am capable of putting an end to suffering. I'm capable of learning from the good examples around me. Then you've defanged your conceit and found a good use for it. <laughs>